Thank you. Thank you. So today I'm going to talk about how to update your toolchain and do it in a good way. And first of all, I'm Tobias. Yeta is my, after, my surname. And uh, yes, it's Finnish, but I'm not Finnish. <laughs> uh, I work with a lot of things that makes me both very liked at the company I work at and also very disliked because I like to change stuff up. But I also try to do it in a way that is better for everyone. Um, and my formal role is that I'm the team lead for the build team at Plex. And then you may be under, wondering, what is Plex, right? And I have this very nice business slide that I borrowed from our business uh, stuff. Uh, and basically, the idea behind Plex is that you want to create your own Netflix, Google Photos, uh, music streaming, all in one neat little package. So you download and install the Plex Media Server on basically anything. This is what, uh, what we work a lot with. You can install it on your home computers, Windows, Linux, Mac, but you can also install it on your NVIDIA Shield devices, on your gaming consoles, on your uh, phones, whatever. And then you can stream all that media you have on your device to everywhere. So we have a very diverse ecosystem with a lot of clients and a lot of servers. And this server, um, this server is the Plex Media Server and that's what we're going to talk about later. So I said two words in the beginning, Conan and Clang, and I believe that if you were here at the last meetup, you know a bit more what Conan is by now. It's a package manager uh, by JFrog. Um, and if you don't know Clang, you probably shouldn't be in this room, so you can get <laughs> um, The Plex Media Server is a 10-year-old-ish C++ application. It was at one time part of the XBMC um, Media Server. Um, we kind of worked with the things, so Plex, the company, was started by one of the guys that was an um, open source developer for XBMC. He ported it to Mac for the first time. So XBMC is an integrated media streaming setup as well. And uh, he took everything he learned from working on that open source product and building the Plex media server. Um, and that is the core of our product. It's a C++ application uh, with I don't know, five, 600 CPP files. It's very large. It takes my poor computer maybe 20 minutes to compile. Um, so it's quite heavy. It's a lot of boost, so that's why it's quite heavy. <laughs> um, and when he started working on this 10 years ago, there was no fancy C++. There was just basic bitch C++, which we call C++ 98. And uh, C++ is a wonderful language, but also have some really sharp edges, which I think everyone in here know. Um, and when you build this application, and what we've seen is that in the Plex Media Server, we don't want to reinvent the wheel, right? I don't think anyone wants. <coughs> we shouldn't write our own SSL library. That's bad, right? We don't want to write our own image processor. So. The Plex Media Server have accrued uh, quite a lot of dependencies. And by now, we're over 60 of them, open source libraries that we depend on. And this is a lot. I think everyone in here sees like, oh, you have 60 libraries you depend on. That's no fun, right? For us C++ developers, 60 dependencies is a lot. Um, <laughs> This is probably me the first time I started working on that. But <laughs> these guys, the JavaScript developers, the new cool kids on the town, right? Uh, the, the part is where we old C++ developers are not you know, invited to. Um, they don't care about dependencies. They have a lot of dependencies. So can anyone guess roughly how many dependencies are modern React Web client has? 35,000. 
<laughs> All right, no, it's uh, 1,269 dependencies. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, 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 the whole whole chain down here. Yeah. Um, so why doesn't the de uh, Java JavaScript developer kind of fade, faint and die when they realize how big their dependency tree is? Left pad. Huh? <laughs> Left, pad. Left pad, right. <laughs> that is a good, good example. Uh, so they have better tooling, but they also have a much more stable target than what we C++ developers are working with. So for example, before I started the work that we're going to talk about today, um, the Plex Media Server was not built once. It was built for 27 different targets. And this included a lot of different Linux flavors, a lot of FreeBSD, Android, iOS, Mac, Wind, everything, right? And when you're working on JavaScript, that is someone else's problem. <laughs> the guy implementing Node.js, that's his problem. For us C++ developers, that complexity comes to us. We need to make sure that we have a binary that works everywhere. Because we can't rely on the operating system, like running our C++ files. There is also the nice problem of having a lot of different compilers. Uh, how many in here work with GCC? How many work with Clang? And how many work with Visual Studio? I feel really sorry for you guys. Uh, <laughs> maybe Intel compiler as well? Someone? Yeah, someone. OK. Um, and so, huh? And a few more. Yeah, and, and a few more, right. There is maybe not that many C compilers, but there is more than one. And that creates some problems sometimes. There is also the fact that we have different standard libraries. We have libc++, we have libstdc++, we have the whatever Microsoft is calling there. Um, well, that's a fun day, yeah, maybe. So there, this is also adds a complexity, because you can't really run on a different standard library if you compile for one. So there's a lot of moving parts. There's also many build systems. And since my work is to work with build systems, I know that all of them suck. Um, in my work, I've worked with CMake, AutoTool, Escons, Make, Visual Studio's own, Meson, Build2, WAF, whatever. Everyone seems to think that I need to write my own build system. And for me, as an integrator, that's nuts. Uh, I, I think they all suck, but CMake probably sucks the least, at least, is what my, in my experience, you mileage may worry. We also have something called compile times, and JavaScript developers have no idea what these mean. <laughs> um, to build all the 60 dependencies for all the 27 targets, and then build a big, huge boost application on top of that, it takes a lot of time. A lot of lot of time, so you know we have all seen this, and this is you know what it feels like working on these applications at times. So rebuilding all your dependencies for every compile is not an option for us. It would take too many hours. I think a full 27 target rebuild of all 60 dependencies took somewhere in the time span of three hours in in our pretty big CI system. So not an option to run on your local machine, right? When I started working at Plex eight years ago, I solved this problem with the Plex Dependency Builder. And I did what everyone else did. I wrote my own build system. <laughs> and I wrote it in Python. And this was great, because the, what we did before we had this was that my boss, the founder of the company, he opened up six VMs on his machine, and he typed in all the commands and tarred up all the dependencies manually. And that took him days. So I wrote this script that basically runs um, a lot of dependency builds. How many mistakes did you make? A lot. Um, 
unfortunately, I didn't have the hindsight of working with this large of a code base and this many dependencies eight years ago. So when I designed this system, I thought it was fine to rebuild everything. If you build the dependencies, store the binaries into a tar file, that's something you do once, right? Or twice. That is not the case. I think we wasted a lot of time at our company just waiting for the CI to finish a build because it rebuilt all the 60 dependencies every time you changed one line. So upgrade OpenSSL because critical security bug, right? One line change. Wait three hours. If you're making a mistake, rebuild from the start. So that was infuriating. I also had this great idea that instead of working with a cross compiler and running on native hardware, I would use something simpler because cross compiling is annoying. And especially when you have 27, 27 different targets, right? So I thought that there must be a better solution to this. And this is actually an Ericsson developed tool, I think, Scratchbox. Basically what it does is that it takes your cross compiler and runs it inside a faux emulated environment. So when you run that environment, you can run configure and it thinks it's running inside an ARM device and then just calls the cross compiler when instead of your normal compiler. This is great in theory and terrible in practice because most of the tools are actually designed to be cross compiled and I can tell you that emulating ARM on an x86 platform is not fast. So we lost a lot of time just emulating binaries, basically. So this was a bad decision. We also have no way to really see what changed. Basically, when my script ran, it built all 60 dependencies. It put it into one tarball, and it used one incrementing number to version the whole build. So in your source code, where you built the media server, you had one number going up. And you had no idea if that number meant that you changed one thing or you changed every single dependency. So it was really hard for the developers to bisect problems because if the problem came down to one change to the dependencies, we did not know really what that constituted. So it was very annoying for the developers to, to kind of figure that out. And yeah. So we went about a couple of years, ago, actually two years ago, starting to think about how to modernize all this. Our first idea was to basically rebuild the Plex Dependency Builder. But at the same time, I felt like, all right, we're, we're not a build team. We're not like a build tools company, right? We shouldn't be doing this. We should be working on what we want to work on and use other tools for this. So we started to evaluate a lot of other tools and that's how we ended up using Conan as our package manager that allows us to have individual packages instead of one big tarball and version it differently and so on. So I'm not going to go too deeply into how Conan works and, and because I think that um, you can find that out by yourself or if you were in the second call in the, in the last meeting, you know. Um, but it works for us is my it solved our problems. And these were kind of the things that we wanted to have from this tool. We wanted to have individual packages instead of one big tarball. We wanted to have, wanted it to handle multiple build systems because we couldn't re-implement every build system in the world, right? It's crazy. Um, even though I probably re-implemented way too many build systems at the time because most of them are not well behaved when you're cross-compiling. Um, we wanted a system that was natively cross-compiling. We also wanted, and this comes into the rest of my talk, we wanted to manage our tool chain with the same tool. Because one problem we had was developers running very different systems. He's running Ubuntu 16.04, and he's running Windows, and he's running Mac OS, and they have a different version of Xcode installed, and that guy who has a different GCC installed and sometimes we spend a lot of time just fucking around with different compilers because developers didn't really 
if I told developers to use this compiler, they didn't really care. Um, so I wanted the compiler to be a part of the package management system, so I could push out a new compiler from a central place instead. I'm just going to ask, probably doesn't work for, I mean, you probably tell me why, but Docker? No, so Docker works fine in the cloud, and it works fine on Linux, and it doesn't work fine on Mac Windows, and it doesn't work fine on Mac. Oh, this was before they fixed all that. Well, try to run uh, Visual Studio inside a Docker container uh, with a specific version of Visual Studio, and you'll see how that works. Sorry. I, I, I know Visual Studio is a bad idea, but right. And that was the whole point. We wanted a version like the compiler as a part of it. So if it didn't work for half of our developers, because half of our developers are Windows and Mac, that is not a system that we could use. Okay. Well, we, can, we can install the compiler without installing full Studio. Maybe, yeah. But uh, we still wanted them to be able to use their IDs and stuff like that. Okay, so it's dev, dev and build. Right? Exactly, right. Yeah. So this was actually using the same compiler that the CI use on your local machine. Okay. And we wanted it to be flexible because one part, yep. But another point is that Docker is not really composed because you say you want individual packages and you may want individual tools as well, like GCC, maybe GCC or something else or something else. And you can't put this into single Docker image if you the same like in your main numbers you can before. Right. I mean, there was a lot of different reasons why we went to a, where basically our compiler and our version of CMake and our version of other stuff is actually a Conan package. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So what's the underlying reason that you're so sensitive to compiler versions? Are you doing like cutting edge stuff or? No, I'll, I'll get to that. Huh? I'll get to that. We wanted the system to be flexible as well because we wanted to have a system where one part of the problem was that Plex Dependency Builder, we could never build on top of it, right? So that was part of this as well. And then we wanted to have reproducible builds. Basically, you want to go back to any point in your history and you want to get the same build you got that you shipped. Um, in order to solve this, now that we solved the, like, the package manager problem, right? We wanted to have a unified tool chain. And we wanted to have this because of this. So what we wanted to do was to go to C++11. It's still an ID8 application at this point. And what we were doing before was that the different NAS vendors came to us and they say, here is our tool chain. And then they are shipping a super old version of GCC. Or an even older version of glibc. So we had, at one point, we had 16 different versions of GCC running on our 27 different targets. So I think that answers your question. We wanted to make sure that we had one place, one compiler, that, so that when we wanted to go to C++11 or 14 or whatever in the future, we had one place to control that, instead of being beholden to whatever the vendors did. So I was going to talk a little bit about what is a tool chain, because I think that most may be assuming tool chain is, you know, the compiler, maybe the linker. Um, so there's a couple of, this is Linux. Um, on the other operating systems, it's less of a problem, but on Linux it's very diverse. And um, what you have on, on, this is what I call a tool chain. My definition of it. So in the bottom we have a specific glibc version. And you need to make sure that you're always on building with the oldest version of glibc you can, if you want to ship binaries to different Linux distributions. And then um, you have the C++ STL, or the standard library. Um, on top of that, you have bin utils. You shouldn't say compiler name, but uh, assembler linker is part of the bin utils. Then you have your compiler, your front-end compiler, and then you have build systems and package manager. So what we've done, before we got all this all the way up here from our vendors, and then say, this is our tool chain, you build with it, and it works on our Synology NAS or our FreeBSD NAS-based device, right? 
What we did instead was to actually build this part ourselves. So we're using a tool that is called Cross Tools NG. And we, in Cross Tools, you can actually configure this is the version of glibc I want to have. This is the version of the uh, GNU bin utils I want to have. So we have, with this unified tool chain, we have one Linux ARM 7 build. We have one Linux x86 build instead of three or four, depending on the vendor. So it cut down on the number of configurations <coughs> that we need to build. But that means building this part ourselves. And I'm actually building this part also, and I'm going to tell you why soon. So one discussion in the beginning was, shouldn't we just go with GCC? Um, and the reason why we went with Clang is that we can have one single binary. We have one Clang compiler for all our Linux targets. We have one Clang compiler for all our Mac OS based targets. Instead of having to handle one GCC compiler per target. And this is just how Clang is structured, where they have a backend that is separated from the front end. And GCC doesn't have that. Or they have, but they can't build it in that way. Um, so this is a, a big reason why we went with Clang instead of and standardizing on Clang instead of GCC. So we can, could have one single compiler. One thing that is really good with Clang also, you're required to use Clang for Android and iOS these days. You can use GCC, but it's not supported. And also, Clang can work on Windows in the future. And that is really exciting for us to be able to get rid of Visual Studio in the future. It was also like a cool logo, right? <laughs> Sorry? On the Windows? I would say by the end of the summer, hopefully. We have all the, all the parts in place, so we just need to make it compile. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, if you run Chrome on Windows today, you actually get a, a Chrome that is built with Clang. Firefox switched as well, didn't they? They did, yeah. yeah. Clang has worked for while on Windows. The big change is that debugging actually works well. With yes, exactly. Now. That's the big change. That mm. You can actually debug programs properly now. So. Yeah, it, now it's fully Visual Studio ABI compi uh, compliant, which is a great thing, so you can actually mix and match. <laughs> One thing we noticed when we started shipping our own compiler to our developers is that some said, hey, this compiler seems slower than the one I had in Xcode. All right, that's strange because the Xcode compiler is also Clang, right? That's weird. But we saw consistently 15 to 20% slower compile times with Clang we got from LLVM.org instead of the one coming in from Xcode. So we thought first, maybe this is because Apple has super secret patches on top of Clang that makes it go super fast. That is not the case. I actually emailed the LLVM dev list and asked why is this, this discrepancy? And the reason is, um, I thought I had another slide there, sorry. But this is basically what we saw, and this is coming in the wrong, so this is what I wanted to talk about, sorry. <laughs> I made the slides before I came in. Um, there are two techniques used at Apple to optimize Clang. The first one is PGO, or profile-guided profile optimization. And the other one is LTO, which is link time optimization. So does anyone know what PGO does? Oh, we have a couple of people knowing. But basically what you do with PGO is that you build a version of Clang that contains a lot of instrumentation. So similar to what you do when you're fussing something. You basically insert a lot of instrumentation into the Clang compiler itself. <laughs> then you use that instrumented version of Clang to build stuff. That collects a lot of profile data, and then you feed that profile data into a real build of Clang, and it generates a faster Clang. Why? Well, black magic is the answer, and <laughs> I tried to actually research this 
together with Christopher at the cafe right before this. And turns out it has something to do with keeping the cache lines in the CPU hot and prefetching the next method that is going to be invoked and stuff like that. So basically black magic, like who knows. So do, do you use your own sources to, for the training? I'm going to show you. Oh. Um, the second thing is link time optimization. One thing I didn't realize before I started to research LTO is that the optimizer in Clang and GCC and Visual Studio only works on a single object at a time. If you compile a C, uh, C++ source into an object file, that's when the optimization happens. If you then link multiple, multiple objects together, there is no extra optimization happening here. Maybe some dead code removal and stuff like that, but very light. LTO instead, the way that Clang implements it, when you, when you compile with LTO, instead of storing an object file with the optimization, it stores down the LLVM IR, the intermediate representation, so the meta language that Clang is using. That is stored in your object file instead of the actual object file. And then all the optimization passes are run when you assemble the full application. So that leads to a much better optimization pass. You can do a lot more when you see the full source of the application instead of just a small part of it. And the results was this. With a stock clang, it took us somewhere around 1.1 1 .1 second to compile. This is just hello.cpp. And then you wonder, why does hello.cpp take over a second to compile? The answer is, I include one boost header. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see, after we optimize this clang, I'm going to tell you how soon, we can see a reduction of almost 30%. And this also shows you that GCC is still trailing a little bit behind when it comes to compilation. You can actually compile GCC with uh, more optimizations as well, but it's not as well supported as it is in Clang. So this is how you build an optimized Clang. You start by bootstrapping, so you download a stock version of Clang. Then you instrument that, so you build the Clang sources with enable IR, I think it's called. And then what we do is that we build the Plex Media Server five times with different optimization passes, with debug info, without debug info, um, for ARM, for ARM64, for x86, and so on. So the point here, what you're trying to do, is to get as a representative sample as possible. It's fully possible to make your compiler slower by doing this. Because if you optimize for the wrong condition, so this is why if you download Clang from llvm.org, it's not optimized in this way. Because it's hard to optimize it in, um, in this way unless you have a very big data set. We don't really care about a big data set. We want to compile the Plex Media Server and we want to do it a lot of times very fast. So for us, this works fine. And I heard what Apple does on the mailing list. They said what they do is that they build their instrumented compiler and then they build their whole source code of Mac OS, compiler all the way up to Xcode with that instrumented compiler. And he said it takes 26 hours to generate all that profiling data. So, you know, you work with what you have. This takes us around four and a half, five hours to generate an optimized version. Is there any likelihood of the correctness issues? No, no correctness errors, because it's, it's going to execute the same code. It's just going to do it in a different way. Uh, did you measure the, how much PGO uh, improved performance versus LTO and together? LTO gives you around 5% in, improvement. It's not a lot. It's minor. PGO is the big difference. But I would uh, recommend everyone here using Clang if you're using it in any way, you can always enable LTO for free because it's just the same compile 
and you get a better version of it. It's a little faster. But if you want to see big results and you have a fixed data set, you should definitely look into using PGO. But uh, they tell you add a new dependency to your project, then you have to build another flag. It's like well, not necessarily. So it depends, right? Because we don't really know. There is no way to really understand the profiling data. Um, but what I've seen, so for example, on, on this example here, this compiler over here is not built against that Hello CPP. It's built against our Plex Media Server. But since Plex Media Server is compiling a lot of boost, that is actually bo boosting uh, this simple test program as well. So it's not as clear cut to say that the compiler will be slower if you compile a specific other source code. But if you have major changes, or if you add another optimization pass, or if you're starting to work with a completely different backend to output, I don't know, PowerPC code or whatever, then you might want to do, retrain it. But if you're just adding more CPP files, I don't think it matters. So we're down to 16 targets and two compilers instead of 27 targets and 12 compilers, or whatever we had before. Crazy. So that's a pretty big win. Not only compile times, but also developer sanity. Uh, this was not an easy trip for us to take. It's taken a lot of time. Um, I've been working on this as part of my job for a long time. For a long time, I was the only developer on this project. And for the last eight months, I have had another guy helping me out. But this has been a hard project. It's also hard to do such a big change and QA it in a way that you know that you're confident. But as of now, all binaries you can download from Plex.tv is built with this new tool chain. So it's a big milestone for me. And we had some interesting bumps in the road. Some of these are directly tied to the tool chain. And some of these are just because we changed the whole build system and everything. We introduced a couple of funny things. This was one that took us quite a while to find. When we got the Android builds up and running, what we saw is that as soon as any exception was thrown inside our application, or actually inside a third li party library like Boost, and it propagated up into our application, the application crashed. Does anyone say, yay, I know exactly why that is in here? No? It was because of RTTI. So runtime something information. I don't know exactly. So, yeah, yeah. So what happened was that in Android, you don't rely on the system OS loader to load your shared libraries. You're actually telling the Java bridge to load your libraries. And what happened was that we loaded them in the wrong order. So the libraries that was loaded, the third party libraries, was loaded with the GNU STL. And our application was loaded with the Clang STL. So the information didn't match up in the memory. So when the exception was thrown, we got the wrong uh, stack trace, basically, or the wrong unwind information, and it crashed. Sorry? This is typically the AI problem. You can't mix two <coughs> Exactly. But uh, in this case, it was a load a runtime error, right? Because we, it happens in the GNI bridge. It doesn't happen in the link time. Oh, it's same. If you load like a static Oh, yeah, yeah. You mean like that. Yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah, I, I agree. But what we, it doesn't matter what the binary is linked to. It matters what the GNI bridge does. And that's why it was so hard to find. Because the binary link table looked, looked correct. But not the GNI bridge. Because it loaded the libraries in the wrong order. Um, another thing, so we're using a library called Saucy, which is a database abstraction uh, library. So it abstracts SQLite and MySQL and stuff like that for us. Um, and what happened was that it crashed on Windows 
when the database was locked. Turns out that Saucy is not a really nice C++ library, and the destructor of Saucy can actually throw an exception. Everyone is groaning. So this is actually, this is actually allowed to do in versions before C++11. And it didn't happen on our Linux platforms because we were building it with uh, std equals C++ 98. But on Windows, the compiler doesn't understand that. So it's always a C++ 11 ABI. And the funny thing was that this was supposed to be protected because if you look in the source header, you can see that it has a macro for setting that they allow exceptions from destructors. But it's using the underscore to underscore C++ macro to figure out if you're running on C++11 or not. Visual Studio always returns C++98. <laughs> and there was a blog post about this. They corrected that in Visual Studio 2017, but only if you opt into it. Otherwise, it will still <laughs> remain to be 98. And the reason for this was that when they turned it on, they broke the whole Windows source code, so they didn't want to do that, <laughs> which is an interesting way to develop a compiler. Uh, but uh, turns out there is a, a flag, a compiler flag, that our old build system actually set to be able to work around this. And the difference for us is the, the, anyone who works with Visual Studio, do you know how you, how you turn off a flag from the command line? You put a little minus at the end of the flag. And in our new build system, we missed the minus because it looked like a diff or something. So no one cared. Um, so that was fun. Um, and then we have this one. This one is my favorite, I think. It took me a very, very long time to figure out. On Mac OS, we had random crashes in OpenSSL code. And this was very confusing to us. It took us a very long time to figure out because there was no clear way how to reproduce it. But it seemed like when you did a lot of simultaneous open SSL or SSL connections to the server, it sometimes corrupted something and crashed. But it didn't happen with the exact same source code on the old build system and compiler. So we had no idea what was happening here. And I started to go down on a command line level and compare the com compile flags and compare the output of the preprocessor and trying to figure out if there was something that was different. Turns out what happened on the new build system was that we didn't handle symlinks correctly. Oh, what? Do you know why that matters? No. It's because we managed to load two different versions of OpenSSL into the memory. And OpenSSL is using a lot of global state. And on Mac OS, if you load two different images with the same global state, they overwrite each other. So the problem was that we had one OpenSSL library called libssl.1.0.dilib, and one that was called libssl.dilib. And both was loaded into the memory at different parts of the loader. And that created a conflict in the global state. Kids, don't use global state in your applications, especially not in your libraries. Uh, it might be out of context, but how do you find out what problem? Well, a lot, of, a lot of stupid debugging, like you do. So what I did was setting breakpoints inside OpenSSL, because I could find, after using the address sanitizer, I could find that this global variable was destroyed. And that was creating the crash. So I had to set a, uh, a breakpoint inside that part of OpenSSL. And what, what I noticed was that the first time I saw it, I got one memory address. And the second time I hit it, it was a different memory address. And that's when I understood that something is going on with this global variable that was loaded. Um, these are the trials and tribulations of a <laughs> C++ build manager. <laughs> Um, this leads us to our current state of Nirvana, uh, where all developers are happy and producing a lot of <laughs> code very fast and never have any crashes. 
Uh, no, that doesn't happen. But we're at a state now where we're happy with our current situation. And basically, this is how we do our dependencies. We have a bunch of stuff in our Conan files that describe all the dependencies. So instead of having that one big block of saying this is our dependencies, one number, we now have lists and we can specify a specific version of a specific <coughs> library. Um, and we have one of these files in every source code that is using a C++ or C compiler where we can define this ref here. It's very transparent, but it's um, profiles that describe your compile flags. Uh, and this is the git sha for that repository. It's a great system, I know. <laughs> Over here, we specify which version of Conan we're using. And this is where like, all the magic is happening. We have a Plex uh, toolchain package, which contains Clang, CMake, and stuff like that. And you can just specify this in your file. And then when you run a command, it auto downloads it and puts it into your path. And then you can c continue on building your system off after that. Um, I had a very nice animated GIF that showed this. And it doesn't work. So imagine happiness and sparkling rainbows and stuff like that. And compilers coming automatically from the internet. That is what's happening these days. Um, so to recap, we had a shitty build system, and now we have a good build system. And we have standardized around one compiler, and it was a lot of hard work. But that means that in the future, we can basically change one file to get the new compiler on all our developer machines and all our CI systems. So that is uh, pretty good. Um, I mean, effi efficient time or real world time. Real world time, one and a half year, but efficient time during that is less because I was busy with other projects. How many targets are you running the compiler on? I mean, how many different builds do you have on the compiler? We have 18 or 19 now. Builds of the compiler? Oh, of the compiler, four. Windows, Linux, Mac, and FreeBSD. So uh, uh, one option to keep rebuilding the world is to use uh, compiler caching. This, yeah. Uh, this uh, C cache project, which is very efficient. So any thoughts on that? Yeah, we used CC cache um, our, our, for a while. And uh, we went away from it because then the, the debuggability of it was basically zero. Um, so if you missed, if you got a miss cache, there was no way to really know why. So it was a lot of frustrating rebuilds that also a, re a cold cache rebuild with CC cache is about 50% slower than uh, a normal compiler without CC cache. So the initial compile is a lot slower if you can't share the object file cache. Um, so there are some projects of doing this, like Firefox is using a project they call S3 cache which uses an S3 bucket on Amazon as your object storing cache. And it's something we have thought about looking at, but at the same time, we kind of want to go to pushing down the compile times in general instead, uh, because it probably makes more sense. But CC cache um, was not really fitting out well for us at least. Just for curiosity, have you done the cost analysis for the different use cases? So, for instance, buying developers a uh, machine with twice many cores, mm -hmm. and, uh, pushing out the builds to, to, to some online build farm, and instead saving your time and doing something more productive? Yeah, so. Putting aside all the, all the learning, because mm -hmm. I, I'm sure you learned a lot. Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, so there was other problems with the old system that was not able to be you had to do something about it anyway, because there was not just a compile time issue. It was also new platforms. We couldn't uh, adopt uh, ARM64 platforms, for example, because that support was not in that scratch box. So we had to rewrite that from scratch anyway. Um, so that was one part of the problem. Then um, um, we have done the calculus for doing all the CI builds in the cloud instead. And it's, it's not working out for us. It's, it's way too expensive. Like, 
to have a build time of similar to what we have in our a server farm that we host ourselves right now, to have that in Amazon or something like that instead, it's, it's crazy. Like the cost is insane. Um, so it was not an option for us. No, no, and you know, I mean, most people, so since we're using, all the dependencies are binary managed, right? So if you're a local developer, you only build the server, right? So that still takes me around 20 minutes on my laptop, but it's not taking me four hours. Why don't you use plain code and install common? Why we don't use code and install? Well, Yeah, this is a, a long uh, and winding road. When we adopted the Conan project a long time ago, it was not as full featured as it was now. So we have built a lot of workarounds <laughs> for, for missing features in Conan back from the day. So if I would redo it today, it would probably be a lot cleaner and use a lot more upstream stuff. But we haven't seen the reason to really work with that right now uh, until we got to the point where we could ship what we had. Uh, so, so we're still on a very old version of Conan, I think a year old ver version of Conan, because that's when we kind of started for real to work with Conan. And much of Conan's development has been pushed by my needs as well. So there is actually a, a talk I did at the JFrog conference, where I talked about how we integrated Conan and all the problems we ran into and all the things that we worked around that they have fixed upstream. So if you're more interested in our very specialized setup of Conan, that is a talk that is available on YouTube as well. Any more questions? Yep. Uh, sorry, I didn't understand. You, have, you build only one uh, server product. You don't have multiple internal components which you also build as a common package. We do. So the server is actually built as an embedded library for iOS and Android. So the iOS project is actually using Conan to fetch the server. And then we have desktop applications that are using our transcoder and our video decoding libraries, which are Conan packages as well. So they just grab those as well. So we have a couple of different projects that are all in this setup in different ways. But the server was our main target to develop it. But we also have, at every point where we can see that we can reuse stuff, we reuse stuff. But not 60. Sorry? Not 60. No, not, not 60, no. So are you able to do um, sanitizing builds? Yes. So one part that is really good with uh, the Conan builds we have today is that you can basically specify new profiles for different C++ flags. So we could say, for example, hey, grab me a, a, um, a version of OpenSSL with address sanitizer enabled. And if we don't have that build ready, a binary for that build on the CI, it builds on the local system. So we can target specific libraries to get sanitized and stuff like that as well. Any more questions? Mm -hmm. But you can do it only for specific libraries. Like when you do Conan install, you can set, tell that I want to build OpenSSL with Sanitizer flag. Yeah. And get on the subset, we build. Yeah, exactly. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. That is exactly what we do. And we do that in, in certain places for, um, we, build, we build our transcoder in different configurations. So our transcoder is based on FFmpeg. And we build that in different configurations depending on the platform we're running on. So we can do so, we can have it running on, on Android, both for the NVIDIA Shield, which is a powerful Android device, so we have the full transcoder, but then on your mobile phone, we only have a stripped on version, so then you can actually have that as different configuration parameters to Conan as well and say, Android this, and, but give me this variant, the nano variant or the full standard variant. More questions? <laughs> so this is actually something we had in a discussion the other day, is that if we would rewrite 
the Plex Media Server from scratch today, what technology stack should we choose? And it's hard to beat C++, even though all the shit we get from using it, like, it's still hard to beat because um, there is not many other languages that you can run on all these different platforms, integrate with all these libraries that we need for everything. Um, like just for example, you can't really embed, well, there is like React stuff, but it's really hard to write a single core that you then can um, run on different small NAS devices because then you have, instead you're getting um, the job of porting the, uh, the actual VM and you probably don't want to be in that situation. Another good reason is FFmpeg. Exactly, right. So, so FFmpeg is a notorious hard library to work with um, and uh, it would probably defy a lot of shit that we threw on it. So for example, FFmpeg is a really good example of where we do s strange stuff. So FFmpeg do does not have a Windows, does not compile with Visual Studio because Visual Studio is not C99 compliant and FFmpeg is using a lot of C99 functions. Um, and it only has a makefile based build system. They actually have a Visual Studio based um, build system but it disables all the optimizations. So we actually cross-compile FFmpeg from Linux to Windows, um, but only FFmpeg. So uh, that was fun to set up as well. So you cross-compile it with Clan, I guess? Yes. Yeah. Technically, in GCC, for, because I can't get the flags worked out to Clang, but that is just a time problem. <laughs> <laughs> I had a proof of concept working and then I couldn't get it integrated. So we're still using GCC to cross-compile FFmpeg for Windows specifically. But the idea is that that should be inclined as well. Other questions? Okay, thank you.